Sorry, am I late for your audio? No, no, you're fine. <laughs> Can you mute me before we start? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people. Our guest today is Michelle Chow. Michelle, you ready to be great today? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle is a founder of Amrant Gardist, an e commerce platform on a mission to democratize access to high end, unconventional, and underrepresented designers from different parts of the world promoting the importance of inclusivity, individuality, and social responsibilities. Throughout her career in the past 22 years, Michelle has worked in startups and corporate companies in both leadership and senior level positions. Her expertise spans supply chain, supplier operations management, program management, commodity strategies, and contracts. Michelle, thanks for being here today, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me here today. So Michelle, like most people, most entrepreneurs, you have a lot going on, and we're going to de do a deep dive of that later. But mm -hmm. first, I believe the tagline for your company, at least I saw it on your website, on LinkedIn somewhere, mm -hmm. it says, uh, undiscovered fashion from around the world. Yeah. What, what, what are you trying to do with that? Well, I'm trying to democratize, you know, access to a lot of incredible designers from different parts of the world. Um, I find pieces from different parts of the world and find that a lot of people find that it's pretty bomb that they couldn't find or know about them, you know, in the States. So this is where I discover this problem to solve. So, so Michelle, democratizing access to a fashion, right? I think it might mean a lot of different things, to different people. What does it mean to you? Um, you know, democratizing to, you know, maybe, you know, it's just really getting the awareness of you know, across their geographic area. So, you know, making access to not people who happen to travel to those countries and destination and find them, but also people who have never been to those countries and getting awareness and getting access to them, no matter where they are. So I could be wrong, but New York City is like considered the fashion capital of the world, right? Uh, well, New York, you know, Paris, I mean, there's- Milan. Uh, yeah, Milan. I mean, they have a fashion week like twice a year. So I'm also trying to break into the culture following those two seasons, you know, throughout the year. And I really think fashion creativity is should be something new, you know, throughout the year, you know, um, instead of going twice a year. What are some cities out there like are, are like like fashion capital not like less known than New York? Less known than New York? L less known than New York. What country? Yeah. Oh, um, I honestly think that the Asian um, designers are underrepresented, um, to be honest. Uh, if you look at all those, you know, world famous brands, you don't find a lot of Asian brands that actually break through to that level. And this is where I wanted to focus on helping those designers to, you know, get out there and grow. So how do you find your designers? Like, do they just come to your website? Do you like recruit them? Like, what's the process for that? Well, I, every country destination I travel to, I, I go shop around for different independent designers and I do collect their information that way and review and look at them. And I also have word of mouth for people or designers who come on board on my platform who would, you know, also extend the network to other brands that, you know, fits, you know, my brand because they wanted to associate it with, you know, the brand they wanted to for their own brand, so. So how do you, what's the process for figuring out like this person actually design or actually has talent? Um, how do I, how do I access them? Yeah. Well, I do um, not just look at their design. You know, first it has to be unconventional. Something is against the mainstream, not something you can find at department stores and um, or chain or anything like that. But, you know, I'm really targeting to designers that is not as known, um, but they're emerging, you know, have, you know, good creativity, but also the workmanship 
and quality of the fabric that they choose. So I know a big thing with you is like the social responsibility, environmental responsibility. And I was on this TV show maybe a month ago and they're talking about how people don't realize like how much textile waste there is in the world, right? Like yeah. there's like literally billions of pounds, whatever. Yeah. Can you talk to me about the points of you being a socially and environmentally responsible company and try to solve this challenge? Yeah, I tend to focus on designers who, you know, promote, you know, um, sustainability and society responsibility because, you know, we all own it and we all want to be a future for our future generations to come. So, you know, designers, some designers may have like in the minute ways, you know, by, you know, leveraging, you know, utilizing the, the fabric instead of wasting them. Some are, you know, really up and coming is using clothes, uh, use clothes and create something new and one of a piece. And some designers create one piece that can wear five different ways. And some of them have different or special um, process, you know, eliminate, you know, you know, harmful dyes, you know, that hurts our environment. When someone designs clothes, is there a difference between designing like a silk shirt or cotton shirt or polyester shirt, or is the process pretty much the same? Uh, if they are different, I mean, every designer have their own, um, you know, process. Some, you know, have, you know, use the traditional way, but they use some other ways to, to, um, you know, uh, support sustainability in different way, but not all of those fabric is being processed the same way. So when someone's designing like a, a clothesline, whatever, do they have to buy the materials out of their own pocket or does like the company or someone else provide the materials for them? Uh, they outsource them um, and, you know, outsource the fabric and um, from different countries or um, some of them actually, you know, manage those whole process and do it by hand. Too. So there's some craftsmanship and, you know, their, you know, own dying, special dying process. So next, how do you become involved in the world of fashion? Because I think most people, their kids, they grow up, when you're a kid, like you want to be like a superhero or a fireman or something else, a singer or, you know, a movie star. When, how do you come, come out to be like, I want to be in fashion? That is something that I always wanted to do, um, but I never really think about what my passion was until pretty late in my career. Uh, it's just one of those experiences. I went on a Disney cruise with my daughter. I saw all those staff smile is so genuine. They actually smile from the bottom of their heart. They really in love with their job. And I start thinking like, oh my God, you know, wouldn't that be cool if I do what I love and love what I do every day and really enjoying doing it. So, you know, I start going back to you know what I want always wanted to do but I know I'm not a creative material but I know I always wanted to be working in fashion um, so you know and it just because of my travel experience and what I um, got compliment for you know when I come back from my trips I thought there is a problem that I actually can solve and further as I do customer discovery talking with designers I realized that designers having their own challenges too, because it's very difficult and expensive to get the names known out there. If they're attending fashion shows or exhibits, um, it, it costs them a lot of money and not even guarantee the you know rate of return of their investment. So I thought, you know, this is where I can help out and being kind of their advocate, you know, to help them grow and, you know, increase awareness of their brand building engagement with audience and so really take them you know across the border you know wherever they are located so michelle what's your like are you do you self-teach yourself all this fashion stuff do you have a degree in fashion like how did you get up to speed and learn the fashion industry well i'm very i'm very fortunate that i have a team of people who's working with me on this project um they're they're they, they share um the same vision I do and they are very passionate about fashion and I I learned you know along the way so I think um you know I'm very fortunate having a great team in place you know knowing the industry and teaching me about different things about fashion and I also have great relationship with designers I'm working with we're just like partners um because it's a really a win-win I'm here to help them so 
we do collaborate ideas and working together on different things and um, we could do in marketing and social media and we collaborate with you know online virtual event that I do on a regular basis too where I get designers in front of a camera live um, and interact with audience and showcasing their exclusive items that they design for avant-gardists or some some are not but they are you know there are exclusive items that is exclusively designed for us and you know those interaction keep it's all about you know storytelling right who who they are if if they're just selling through some you know random platform or store nobody's going to know who the designer is and they can't resonate you know and building that connection with the designer so michelle like you know if you have a startup or a small business they tell you, you know like product market fit idea validation how does a designer does a designer do the same thing like do they, they need to this design what they think is gonna, the company's gonna the customer's gonna want to buy or they like take like different samples out and like hey and product market fit it so to speak um they don't um and actually that i realize that designer are mostly still you know going through the very traditional business way and you know when it comes to creativity they have to believe in their own you know, philosophy, how they wanted to design their things. Um, but they do aware of what's going on out there. Like during the pandemic, they would design something that's more comfortable and more comfy that you can wear at home or more, you know, um, uh, you know, ready to wear. So can a designer be too creative? What I mean is like, they're, 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 of course, they're creative, they have all these great ideas. But can it be like, I won't say like out the wall and kind of wacky, like off the wall, right? But can it be like too off the wall and too outrageous? And they need somebody to like, come, hey, creative person, can you like tone it down a little bit? Is that a problem? Or is it like, just like you're creative, just go for it? Yeah, I think, it, it, you know, if you're creative, go for it. I mean, when I select designer, I can kind of tell whether they're really extreme, you know, really out there or, you know, they're unconventional in a way that, you know, it's more for everyday where, you know, I can get a sense of that too. But I, I don't think that, you know, creativity has a limit, you know, if they if they created something is really out there, you know, and it has a statement, there's always people out looking for something very different, you know. So for your on, on your website, how does someone what's the price for someone selling something on your e commerce site? How do I? Suppress? Yeah, how do you how do you select someone to pick? How do you pick someone to sell on your website is a process to go through like vetting process? I, I, I'm going with word of mouth to start with. I also collect a list of designers from, um, you know, different sources, you know, whether by people or my personal, um, um, you know, uh, awareness from travel or, you know, or, you know, social media that I learned um, from, you know, Instagram or you know, when you are interested in something, Instagram quickly, you know, goes to you. So next, like suppose someone's on your website and they're selling, they haven't sold nothing for like a month. Do they stay on there forever or they have to sell a certain amount of uh, clothes in a certain time period to stay on there? They'll stay on there um, because they're also aware that Avant is also a startup too. So I'm going through the process of building brand awareness of who we are and, you know, what we stand for. And, you know, I'm, and, and we're just working together and build this together. So we're all in. That's great. Yeah. So next, so how does one become a designer? Does someone just like wake up at when they're 10 in the morning and say, I want to make dresses and clothes and outfits? I mean, what's the process? Like, do they have to like, like get a fashion degree? Is it like work experience? What's the process for that? I, I haven't been to a designer myself. Um, but everyone has their own story. I have designer who, um, you know, came from, you know, fashion schools and some, you know, was a dancer, you know, or, you know, related to art or some sort, you know, people just, you know, follow their passion and start creating something and building their own brand. But, you know, um, not everyone can become one, unfortunately, because it's just very hard industry to survive. It's a very fast paced and uh, very fast industry, but I'm trying to change that. I mean, it's, you know, going from fast fashion has been very popular for some time. And I'm really thinking that, you know, this industry is shifting so 
slow fashion, something more, um, more you know, delicate and more you know creative um, and unique, rather than going with trend, which is not something that we we follow because um, those designers' pieces are very um, unique and and timeless. So you know, it's not like you know, point out from your closet next year, it's going to be out of date, you know, it's always going to be fresh because it's so unique that you don't find it, you know, in the department store. So what's like, like, I'm sure it's not a normal career path, but what's like a quote unquote normal career path for designer? Normal, normally they will go through, you know, fashion school and then they, you know, they do internship as well. And then, you know, whether it's do, during their, their, um, education or after they get some, you know, experience working with brands um, to get exposures and experience. And then they start, you know, making their own stuff and build their brand. It's very, I hear a lot, you know, going through this path. So from your point of view so far, mm -hmm. what characteristics do you like the successful and the creative like and the better designers have versus the ones that don't succeed in the career path? Um, I would think that it's no different than a lot of the startup, you know, personal opinion is, you know, you have to plan your, 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 your runway, you know, you have to do um, customer discovery, really understand, you know, you know, what, you know, whether what, what you created has a product market fit and going through that discovery process um, and have a long enough runway because it's, it's not like you build your brand and you can expect to become, you know, scalable, you know, within a short period of time, you have to think about how you gonna, you know, um, plan out your, your runway accordingly and your costs and all that. And they usually are one man show. They do everything from sourcing to design to manufacturing, everything selling, uh, and they don't have the resources to do it. And this is where I think that, you know, avant-garde can help. So if someone is a designer, do they like, do they say, I'm going to design, I'm only, I'm only going to design shoes. I'm going to design women's clothes, only this, or is it more like I'm a designer and whatever someone pays me to do, that's what I'm going to do. They usually um, have, you know, they, they still, some, most of them are still following, you know, the fashion week schedule, you know, um, I'm going to design, you know, some, you know, a new collection to plan for, you know, spring, summer, you know, next year. You know, this is what my schedule would look like. You know, I'm gonna have, you know, these pieces that I'm gonna, you know, put in production by such and such time so I can make it before the uh, fashion week. You know, that's really typical. Um, but where I'm going from is, you know, it shouldn't be twice a year. You know, it should be throughout the year. Creativity comes and goes, right? You know, you never know what, when those ideas come. I, I personally don't, I'm not a designer, but you know, I, I know ideas, comes and goes and it could be happening anytime. So after Mash talking about all the fashion weeks, or well, not all but the limited number of fashion weeks, mm -hmm. I can't imagine how competitive it has to be to be a designer and, and be able to present on fashion week, right? Well they have to pay a lot of money. Oh, because it's it's pay to play, okay. Yeah. And they usually have to pay for, you know, a couple thousand dollars, you know, to go to these fashion weeks and then you have to rent, you know, your booth and you know, all the equipment and whatsoever, your travel, accommodation, everything um, in advance. I mean, you, you just don't know whether you're going to sell or not. Um, so that's where I feel bad, you know, for designers. If you want to get known and get noticed, you have to get on the runway. And there's a lot of designers that are out there that, you know, their runway can accommodate and have maybe two or three sources. So of course, I, I think, and I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of like high-end department stores have own designers, but do stores like we'll say like Kohl's, um, Costco, Ross, do they have designers too? I don't think that they do. Okay. Um, they actually bringing in brands, you know, that is known already. I mean, they do have the ability, you know, to negotiate super, super low, like wholesale price and they can return stuff back to um, the designers that it's not sold or, you know, they have very, very harsh terms for people who want to sell through them. And that those brands usually are already at scale, you know, already known, you know, that you can have that level of resources to support. 
So is, is it like any industry, like the group, like like the, like the top one percent of any industry, like the well known means of followers on Instagram, it is designed the same way. Like there's like top one percent who has a lot of followers, make a lot of money. Everyone else, like I won't say struggling, but like you know, like not so so um, great in the career. It's the same process. I'm not sure if I. So like most most career paths, whether you're like a software developer or whatever the case be, like one percent is making all the money, mm-hmm. have a lot of followers, like pretty well known, and the rest of them know like not struggling, like they're just working nine to five. That you know it's the same with designers, like the top designers are well known, everyone else is like pretty much like like working day to day. I think a lot of it is you know it's about networking, who you know and who you associate with. I mean, if you you know fresh grad came out of school, if you say that you you know in any career, if you say that you or you intern with, you know, uh, McKenzie or uh, or famous designers, you're gonna get you know noticed a lot quicker, you know, because you have a good looking portfolio, and that's I think it's an easier way to get on a fast faster track. Um, but it's very tough to get on top of there. You know, it's all about who you know. I think pretty competitive for, then. For, yeah, it's 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 very very competitive particularly on the fashion side of uh, field. A lot of people aren't interested in it. Um, not a lot of people actually become one. For those who actually become one, it, not a lot of them become successful. Who determines what is quote unquote in fashion? Like who determines that? Is like some big fashion board somewhere that says this color is in this season or this is in this season or is, this, is, a, is a market determined what's in fashion? Well, anything that you can name it fashion is the it's the type of fashion where you want to categorize what you are going for some designers are you know targeted to just design for you know how to pour some more avant-garde fashion and there is some you know very um mass produced you know there's you know zara you know forever 21 i mean those you know very big fast fashion uh, companies i mean it depends on where they wanted to place the brand you know because every every designer has a different inspiration so michelle what's excite you about the fashion industry right now um i think it's the creativity that i get to see and you get to um see something is not in it's not so ordinary you know like boring um, you want to celebrate, you know, something very different and creative. I, I really like that, you know, freshness and um, newness. It's something that surprises you. And um, you don't expect to, to see. So correct me again if I'm wrong, but I think most creatives, they're great at creating stuff or, or artistic, whatever. But a lot of them are probably aren't the best at doing the business side, right? How are you helping these people, like, you know, do the business and the creative side? Um, you know, we do collaborate with designers too. And one way that I am, you know, um, planning to do is having designer to designer, you know, communities too. So where everybody shares, you know, their own ideas and, you know, and actually can do collaboration between, you know, those friends and, you know, helping each other, you know, learning from others. And, you know, a lot of times it's just, you know, one single idea can branch out to something else. You know, it's all about um, collaboration and create something, you know, A plus B, you know, and then, you know, create a C. <laughs> so I can't think of the name. There's a show that comes on Bravo. It would like, they have like this um, bunch of fashion designers and they get judged by famous designers. I can't think of the name of it, but is that, is that, is that a realistic uh, showing of designers what they go through? Um, I personally didn't see that. Um, personally, do you see that a lot? Yeah, my wife watches a lot. I can't think of it. It's like, oh, man, I can't think of it. Anymore. But there's like, they show like the stress of like trying to get ready. The, the guy would say, you have a show in like 30 minutes. Have 30 minutes, I like, put some kind of design on stuff right there. Mm-hmm. And a guy walks around, give him suggestions. Sometimes they take the suggestions. Sometimes they don't, you know, mm-hmm. it's like almost like, a, like, you know, sort of the, the voice on TV, like the, mm-hmm. something like that. So for fashion designers. Yeah. I think it doesn't matter whether you're a fashion designer or you're in other fashion. You know, I think, you know, taking constructive feedback is always a way to make yourself better and seeing things that you don't see. It's all about 
treat it, you know, it's not about like one mind, you know, it's, it, 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 it involves with, you know, other new things that you don't see and creating something that you haven't thought about. And I think taking critique and, and, and constructive feedback is helpful um, in any profession, no matter where you are. Can you talk some more about the fashion industry in, in Asia? Um, in Asia, yes. Um, their process is so different from the Western culture because they are designed to be more fitted. They have more, um, it's more made to your body. And I would say more fitted than the Western culture. And there's a lot of, you know, asymmetrical, you know, type of design. Like the one I'm wearing today is from my Asian designers on my platform too, um, called Finny Typesetter. It's, you know, her, her design is phenomenal. Um, I like every pieces that she created. It's just because it's very uh, uh, symmetrical um, to me. And I think a lot of Asian designers use a lot of that, you know, into the details. And they're really into the details from something, you know, like a jacket, you know, even though it's a jacket, but you, you, you could see the uniqueness of the details that put into that. It's very incredible. So, so Michelle, next. How did COVID affect the fashion industry? A lot. Um, I, I feel so bad for a lot of the designers close, have to close the doors because of the COVID. Um, I think this is a, a evolution of the industry too. I mean, it's just pushing people to go online and going online is very saturated right now, um, I would say, because people um, who can't survive retail stores they have to go online and you know it's not the same as you were doing retail and this is why I think having a bar artist which is something I started you know before the pandemic occur and that is the trend where the industry is going um you know you see all these AI you know AR you know technology it's going to you know, continue to develop, you know, this is with these, you know, to democratize, you know, things, not only in fashion, things from different parts of the world, um, much greater than ever. So you, Michelle, you started your company like right before the COVID hit, the pandemic hit. Yeah. Can you talk about somehow like your own business, but other people aren't like, what made you different? What made you like, you know, like take advantage of the situation, so to speak, that's probably worded badly. But why are you still in business and other people who came even before you did are no longer in business? Partly because I hold my full-time job. So I am working two jobs and sleeping like four hours. Yeah, we're going to do a deep dive in that in a little bit too. Yeah. <laughs> so I do, I don't sleep a whole lot because uh, I have two jobs now. You know, that's how the way how I survive. Um, I, I think I've learned... Um, my business a lot greater in depth as I go from day one. I think I know a lot more in fashion than what I didn't know about. And you have to adopt, you know, the way of doing business is also different in the creative world versus in, you know, a corporate world. So, you know, every day is, is a learning journey. It's exciting. So why did you decide to do this company, you know? Why do you, why become an entrepreneur? Um, I always wanted to, to start my own business. Um, I, I'm very passionate in fashion, but business is something that I always know that is part of my strength and I love business. I be, I mean, I, I'm not a, a big fan of reader, but I buy a lot of business books just because I'm interested in business. So I always know that I wanted to, to um, become, you know, uh, my own boss at some point. So you still have your full time job and you work on the bigger corporation in Seattle. Talk about process like, you know, you work with this bigger corporation and talk about what is the process like, you know, do I quit the corporation, go full time to startup? Do I keep the corporation job and like work two full time jobs? Like that had to be like a mess, like you're going through, like how do you decide, how do you decide all that? And like, how do you decide like, all oh, right, I can survive on four hours sleep a day? <laughs> I actually, 
been raised that way, you know, when I was younger. Um, I used to uh, work full time when I was going through my college all those years. Um, so I'm pretty used to, you know, getting a lot on my shoulder at any given time. I just can't, you know, stand this routine, you know, you know, eight to five kind of thing. I need to continue to be challenged and I need to be, you know, um, stay very busy you know? yeah i'm like you like i don't see how people like work nine to five and just go home and do nothing right and yeah, like how can yeah. you do that i just I, I don't i mean i'm not we're not built that way but exactly i mean that's some people are like that so i don't know yeah and my energy never drained for whatever reason and people are like how do you stay awake you know when you only slept two hours last night or not even sleeping at all i just don't know i just keep going i think that's where my passion uh is because i i love what i do so I don't feel tired. I always energetic. I don't shut down unless I shut down my computer. Sometimes my mind's still going. I I couldn't sleep just because I'm still thinking about work. Yeah, I'm jealous of you. Like I, I need like six, seven hours a day. I, I, if I do like four or five, I shut down like for four days. <laughs> six hours is the is the luxury for me. You know, I don't get six hours of sleep a lot. <laughs> but you know, a lot of you get a lot done though. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, and um, I love it. You know, I I love to keep myself busy. Um, I, I love seeing, you know, what is being done, you know, after all these hard work, um, I enjoy it. So what would have to happen to your startup for you to quit your corporate job? Are you, are you going to, are you saying yourself, if I get the X amount of revenue per year, or is there any, like any, anything out there where you say, okay, I can do this all time. I can quit my corporate job. I think, um, you know, at the point when I can afford to pay, um, my team, um, fairly and also pay myself a salary mm. to make a living, then, you know, that's the point when I wanted to quit my full-time job. Okay. And is there any overlap between your startup and your, your full-time job? Like the same skills or anything like that? I think a lot of it is business acumen mm. skills, you know, really assessing your risk. You know, it's a lot, you know, not, not direct role, but, you know, it's those business sense and acumen that I've learned over the years um, in business, whether in a startup business I worked for before or in the corporate world, you just grow. I mean, if I start this business when I first came out of college, I might not, you know, be survived right now. You know, you don't know. Yeah, that's definitely a stereotype that I believe is not true. Everyone says, oh, the startup people from Stanford, you know, 21 years old, you know. That's I found that so untrue. It's more like people like our age, you know, like yeah. been around the block, so to speak, you know. Yeah. And the thing about too, like, like I try to tell people, like, I have like crazy focus now, crazy energy, right? Like when I like when I was in my twenties, like now I get get up on my age, I'll be like older to crap in a rocket chair. But <laughs> like now I have so much focus and energy, right? I'm not, I'm always going, going, going. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I'm yeah. sure you're the same way, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how I am. And I I'm used to. I think if one even if when I'm going on vacation. My family love rela re relaxed vacation, but I just can't. I have to, you know, get up early in the morning <laughs> and go, 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 go. Like <laughs> you have the whole day planned out. Yeah, exactly. And that, it can be very exhausting if, you know, my spouse cannot, you know, take that because, you know, I'm just very exhausting to be around. <laughs> so I, I know um, you do a lot of traveling, both for fun and for your job. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the favorite places you've been to? Japan, Japan. is my favorite so far out of all the places I visited. Well, besides Hong Kong, where I was born and raised, um, Japan has very, very nice culture, people. Um, you enjoy even walking down the street. You know, you see everything is being packaged really nicely um, and good quality and very creative. Um, I, I love Japan most in everything. If I have to pick one place that I want to live, I think Japan would be my top. So totally random Japan story. So I was in the army and we were going to stay. We were stationed with my family in Seoul, my family three years, right? Mm -hmm. Once year we go back to States to visit family, right? Mm -hmm. So every year, my only experience with Japan is this, is, is the McDonald's the airport, right? Uh, and like every time we go to McDonald's, it matters two in the afternoon, two in the morning, there would be at least 200 people in line at McDonald's. And KFC too. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> It, it's like and everyone says the best McDonald's in the world. Like it's just insane how the line was. Yes, yes, it is. Um, but I actually stay away from those places when I go visit. Yeah. I, I, I like to go to very, very Japanese style restaurant. I try different 
type of cuisine, you know, um, there, you know, there's different type of food in Japan. And I have very exhausted list of favorite things in Japan I wanted to eat. <laughs> so is there a place you travel to where you actually had a lot of fun is a good time? But most people are like, you had fun there? Like, how, how is that possible? Like, like, I would never go there if you actually had a good time there. Hmm, that's a great question. No, I think, you know, all those places, I think people in general, people around me, you know, love traveling too. So um, I think, no, I haven't traveled to any destination that is kind of, you know, off the wall. So yeah, to speak. yeah, I haven't yet. <laughs> but you do, know, do you have, want, do, where do you want to go travel to next that you haven't been to? Um, South Africa okay. is one. Um, South Africa, you know, living in a safari is another experience. It's very exciting. Do you have you know Nick Hughes from Founders Live? Yes. So he's on a podcast. He told me South Africa was very Johannesburg was favorite place to travel to. Oh, is that right? He said that was his like his favorite place ever. Yeah, yeah. I I've seen pictures and you know I you know, ask my husband to look into it at some point, but maybe at some point it's, it's not cheap. You know, if you wanted to go on a nice trip to yeah. South Africa safely, it's not cheap. <laughs> I can imagine. And so you, you came to the United States from Hong Kong at age 14. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about how the so-called immigrant experience has helped you be a better entrepreneur? Can you hear, uh, hear the, hear the time like in Silicon Valley that a lot of investors mm -hmm prefer to invest in immigrants because they have the drive and, you know, they're, they're not spoiled and mm -hmm. don't take stuff as granted. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very tough um, experience for me because when I moved here, my parents still in Hong Kong. Um, my dad used to have a business in China and, you know, they still have a lot of things to, you know, um, to settle before they moved. So it was me, my sister and my cousin who got here first and, you know, not having your family. And then, you know, we stay with our aunt before, which we didn't have, you know, very good experience because of my, uh, my uncle. So we moved out of there and being in Seattle, uh, living with a guardian because we weren't old enough to get our own place. And we have a rough experience too, living with them. So, um, you know, I have to walk out and get my own groceries um and how are you all at 14 when this goes on yeah yeah i had a very tough start and so y'all came to seattle because you have family here the guardians or is this a random city y'all picked it was uh, i had a family in texas and that's why i started you know but after two months i moved to seattle same with my dad's friends you know friend you know in seattle so they can be our guardian while we were in school and, and your parents were still back in Hong Kong. Yeah, they were still back in Hong Man, Kong. Man, that's a big move right there. Yeah, that was, it, you know, moving from one place to another part of the world is tough itself. I still remember, I couldn't even, I went to restaurants and look at the menu. I didn't even understand the menu. Yeah, I'm kidding with the thought press of your parents, like, hey, I'm going to send my kids all across the world. Like, that had to be like an agonizing decision. Yeah, that. That was something that they planned for years. Um, they applied for, you know, the visa for 11 years before actually, you know, come to our turn um, because we're going from, you know, relate, uh, relative, you know, sponsorship to come here. So they always knew, you know, it, partly because of 97, they're scared of, you know, um, the, the communists taking over Hong Kong. So that's something they, they planned when I was a kid. So I'm, I'm somewhat ignorant on, on some things. So Hong Kong is a, actually a part of China, correct? Yeah. And so I'm presuming the language of Hong Kong and China is the same? No, it's no? not. Okay. Uh, Hong Kong speaks Cantonese okay. and China for the most part, except for maybe Guangdong um, province mm -hmm. is speaking Cantonese. Other, other than that, it's all Mandarin. So it's okay. different. And written wise, they're they, they're, they're in simplified Chinese versus Hong Kong is traditional Chinese. And Hong Kong used to be on a British rule for the longest time. Yeah. Then they're independent. Yeah. Or they gave it, I always, I always gave it away, but then they like, transferred to China rule or something like that. So a bunch of politics and yeah. all that kind of stuff's involved with it. Yeah, yeah. It, it took, they took over in 97. There wasn't a lot of changes until the recent years. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen on the news, yeah. but 
trying to make it more common, so to speak, I guess. Yeah. And we knew that it was coming. It's just a matter of time. And so, you know, to, to, you know, get moved to U.S. is something that we were prepared for. Um, I was actually excited uh, until I got here and been through those tough times. And now thinking back, it actually made me the it made you a stronger person, yeah, stronger person. And, you know, I work when I was 16 years old. Um, and then, you know, I start working full time later on, you know, throughout my school years and, you know, really getting real world professional experience makes me you know, more mature than, you know, people in my same age group. And you, I think you see you have kids, right? I do. I have two kids. Have you or have you by yourself or have you taken your kids to Hong Kong? Oh, yeah. Many times. Okay. Yeah. They they love it. They love traveling too. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we're from believer. People need to start traveling more. If they should take the kids traveling more, you know, yeah. get a different mindset. Exactly. I, I want my to raise my kids to be very tough and very effective. So, I mean, if my husband were to be more flexible, I wouldn't mind living in different places, mm -hmm. you know, every two years. Like, or air, so. like Airbnb in different places or yeah. whatever case it be. Yeah, yeah. I'm more adventurous and he's the other extreme. So. Yeah, see, <laughs> uh, see, I'm uh, my, I'm the adventurous one. My wife like has to have like, like a list 20 miles long, 20 pages long, you know. Uh -huh. What is this? What does this happen? What does this happen? You know, I'm mm -hmm. more like, let's go do this. Yeah, you know? exactly. Have you checked the weather? Have you done this? Have you checked this? No. <laughs> We'll figure it out. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So is there any meaning besides the name of your company? Is it like have deep meaning to you or anything like that? Or is this just a name? Uh, it, it, my thought process is I wanted to come up with a name that tells the world that, you know, hey, we represent something unconventional, something very unique. And avant-garde is a, you know, is a really uh, common use term, but I don't, I don't think you can, you know, trademark something like you know avant-garde but you know i i made the name avant-garde is you know it's meaning that people who actually you know you know love our fashion are avant-garde they are people who love avant-garde so i'm presuming that your husband and your kids support what you do and all that kind of stuff yeah can you talk about the points of like your close friends spouse close family supporting you a lot of people like i support you but they don't really support you right can you yeah. talk about the points of that? Yeah, I can tell you that um, besides my husband, um, I don't think anybody really supports me and my family. Unfortunately, they they feel like that. Well, you know, like they don't they don't get it right. No, they don't, and they um, they want they wanted me to stick with my corporate job. You know, you 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 know you you're making comfortable you know life, and why are you working yourself like this? You know, for something's not realistic um, and they don't get it. And my husband is very supportive of what I'm doing. And he would encourage me sometimes that, you know, um, if they can see what your vision is, they would have done it themselves or, you know, or they're, they're entrepreneurs. So there's gotta be something that you see nobody sees and you, you know, you believe in it and just try it, you know, so you don't leave any regret. So, are you bootstrapping this? I am. Are, are you planning a fundraising event? So you're going to try to bootstrap the whole thing? What's your plan with that? Uh, I'm, I'm planning to take the business to a point where I'm scalable and start raising funding. So I'm trying to bootstrap as long as I possibly can. So how, how are you doing with this, right? I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with this, right? So they start fundraising or, or whatever, and they and they pitch or whatever. And they have a vision of a company, but they have a, they have a challenge telling the vision to the investor, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to make sure you tell your vision to the investor, so to speak, that they get it? How do I tell them about my business? Yeah, how do you make sure they get the vision for your company? Well, you have to show them, you know, this is, you know, what the customer is saying. This is what, you know, the demand and customer pain point is. You show them, um, you can prove them that there is people are interested and they're buying, you know, there is a product market fit. Here's the growth. Um, this is why I wanted to take the business to a point where it's scalable before I raise funding. So I'm not, you know, spending time pitching, you know, 200 companies and getting $20,000 in funding. You know what I mean? Exactly. So um, there's a show that comes on TV called, um, there's a singer named T-Pain. He has a show on TV called uh, T-Pain School of Business. Mm -hmm. I watch it on a regular basis. 
So one like a week he follows this lady out of Brooklyn. Her show, her her company is basically, you know, all the, all the thrift stores or secondhand good stores. Mm -hmm. They put all those clothes in an app, and people like go on the app and they like, like say whatever, and they say okay, what you want is in like you know Denver, Colorado, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And she said she spent like a month in Silicon Valley like, trying to pitch it and got nothing right. But then you know start having revenue and stuff, and people start calling back. Oh, we get it now. We want to invest now, right? Exactly, and you know looking at Elon Musk when he started you know, his, you know, empire, nobody actually agree uh, with what he was doing. And he'd get a lot of criticism um, for what he was doing. But he keep on going down what he believed in. He's actually, you know, became very successful. But, you know, imagine if he took the advice from people, oh, don't do that, you know, or, you know, this is going to fail. There won't be, you know, Elon Musk. Yeah, I remember, I could be make this up, but I remember seeing where like um, Harold Schultz, he was saying like, you know, the first thousand people talk about investing in Starbucks making bigger, they all said no. It was a thousand and one, one person said yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, probably the, that's why they become a unicorn. <laughs> yes. Um, think about some lessons you learned so far in your entrepreneur journey. Um. I learn a lot. I think um, I have to learn to be very patient and, you know, your emotional re resilience too, you know, in many different ways and working. You, you can't be um, so, you know, strict on, okay, you know, if you, if you wanted to go do this, there's many different ways to get to where you want it to be. You just have to be receptive of you know, different, different environment, different industry to, you know, adopt yourself into it. And I do a lot of self meditation and keep telling myself, you know, hey, you know, look at this from a positive perspective, you know, why not giving it a try, you know, and see what happens instead of what you think is the right thing to do. So have you dealt with this? I think most entrepreneurs are like, okay, I want to be here in six months, here by year. But oftentimes, like year comes two years or three. How do you deal with the frustration and how do you make sure you're patient of like, you know, like I'm, I'm doing the right thing, I'm in the process. And also follow across like, I think a lot of entrepreneurs like, we're in the weeds, we're in the trees, you know, and we, and, we, and we fail to look back on the last year. Okay, I'm actually doing something good. I'm actually making progress. How do you deal with those things? You have to, you have to appreciate the things that happen you know, in a positive perspective. I think surrounded with people in positive energy and mind is very important too, because a startup is a very lonely journey, especially I'm a sole um, entrepreneur. I mean, I'm co-founding um, this company and I have no co-founder I can bounce things against. And I'm very fortunate having a good team of people with positive mind um, being around me and then we celebrate every little thing, you know, you don't just talk about, oh, how much sales we make. How about, you know, followers? How about our Facebook group, you know, is growing and, you know, and you have to recognize all little things that you should celebrate and give credit to your team and yourself for as, you know, stepping stone. So, um, you know, of course, my expectation going into this business was different than, you know, what it is today. I think it's very true to a lot of the start of business too. I know like a lot of investors say, you know, you have to have co-founders, but my thing, like, you know, if I you the CEO, mm -hmm. what are you actually gonna tell your co-founder, right? Are you, are you gonna tell them all the bad things all the time? Cause then they might get down on you, right? It's, it's like, mm -hmm. can you really tell everyone that's going on with you if you're the CEO, right? Um, I, I don't have a co-founder and, you know, I always wanted one, but it has to be the right one. And Just like getting married, right? Yeah, exactly. I. I've joined network where you find co-founder, uh, co-founder -co who can do this with you. I found that, you know, I almost got one before and, but he's not really into fashion. I could feel like that, you know, he was really just into making money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a, that's a wet flat right there because you're going to run through a lot of hoops and, you know, ups and downs and you don't want people who see, oh, okay, it's not going to work. So I'm just going to leave. You have to be very passionate to find a way to get there, you know, and you have to pivot, you know, 
you know, if you believe in it, really believe in it and passionate, you'll find a way like I do. You know, I just keep pivoting or, you know, I keep an open mind, you know, to adopt things and trying different things instead of call it itself. I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, stubborn in something I really believe in. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes to make it successful. So for the people on your team, how do you bring them on? Like, what kind of characteristics do you look for? Like, suppose watch, someone's watching this, like, man, I want to, I want to work for Michelle. Like, w- what kind of characteristics? Of what do you want? What kind of background you want? All that kind of stuff. I think attitude is way more important than aptitude. A lot of times, you know, having the right people, meaning, you know, to me is, you know, do they are they passionate with the idea? Do they do they do they believe in what I'm believing in? Um, do they go above and beyond? Are they, you know, so, you know, some people would be just, you know, do what you're told to do, right? You know, if it's not nothing else, nothing like, more, no initiative, exactly, no problem solving skills, exactly. If you, I, I'd rather hire someone who's free, you know, who actually would study and go research and go, uh, you know, do something to to educate themselves rather than people, oh, I know how to do it. I'll just do it. You know, like I, I rather hire someone who's less experienced but with a great attitude, open mind, positive energy. Um, because you really need that for startup. And I'm I'm guessing you have a is a fully remote company that you have? Yeah, fully remote. So how do you when you hire someone, bring them on, how do you make sure they can do remote work? Because I'm a firm believer everyone cannot handle remote work. What's your process to make sure they can actually do remote work? Well, we have um, weekly um, team meeting and kind of going around and statusing, you know, what what's your key priorities on a weekly basis and, you know, um, things that they need to do, action items. And, you know, and that also very um, good at, you know, tagging up with people like, calls every week um how you doing not just about the work itself but also talking with that person and really care about you know what they're going through they may be going through some personal issue Um, we have a trusted relationship you know and share everything with each other and really open and all your people all in the states are all over the world i do have some people in the states i do have people in hong kong i have someone in croatia croatia okay yeah and you know, and also another um, company I'm working with is in Berlin too. So it's pretty, you know, around the world. How do you work through the channels, like the, all the different, um, what's it called? I got to bring like the uh, different hours, the time zones. Um, How do you work through the time zone challenge? That's why I don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I I do, I like last night I, I had a call with, um, you know, a potential designer. Um, I was on the phone with her until... Um, almost 3 a.m. in the morning. I started at one. So that happens to me all the time. So who is your customer? My customers are people, I'm I'm not demographically targeted. I I don't think, I really encourage people to dress for um, themselves and, you know, individualistic is very important. So I'm not trying to people like in certain age. I really think, you know, people can, be you know 60 year old and you know want to dress you know for who they are you know and some are fashionable and uh so the people i'm targeted are are fearless to you know try different things appreciate the uh, creativity and you know someone loves to travel and appreciate different culture um yeah so you know how you, you have like, it's called like red carpet events in Hollywood. It'd be like some favorite famous movie star and they'll say, mm-hmm. you know, so-and-so who you're wearing and they say the person's name. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that's a big deal, right? I'm guessing the person gets, the actress or movie star gets paid to wear the outfit. Mm-hmm. They get, are they getting paid? Like say the person's name. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, that's why the, mostly other big brands are getting noticed because they, they do wear, you know, expensive brands or, you know, well-known brands who can afford to pay these celebrities for you know advertising this free advertising yeah so what what do you see like what's a from your point of view what's been some pros and cons of an entrepreneur that you didn't expect yeah i i don't think that becoming a 
entrepreneur is not like you become the boss and then you know people have to um, listen to what you say that you have to do um, which is I think it's more healthy you know before going into it you know you would think you know become your own boss you can you can do whatever you want and and however you want to do it but I learned that it's actually better off if you create a culture it's open and collaborative and listen to people's ideas and thoughts you know can create something different and something you haven't thought about it's not like the ceo is always right um you're not the smarter person in the company hopefully, also, hopefully you're not the smartest person in the company, no right? exactly exactly you just need to know how to get the smartest people on your team not you becoming the smartest person and I'm, I'm sure you had the same thing like i know so many people start a company because well i don't want to work for a boss anymore i'm going to own boss mm -hmm. well you want from having one boss that corporation have like you know 10 employees being your boss your customer being your boss vendors being your boss i think a lot of people miss that part yeah and and i don't think that it's healthy you know no matter where you work to be honest um but of course you have to answer to you know your boss you know in a corporate world where you don't have to answer to anybody you know as an entrepreneur you know you don't ultimately you still make the decision for your business it's not you know something that your team can can make a decision for you but you know it taught me to start listening more about what people are doing and what people are thinking and taking different perspective with an open mind um that is a a, a learning process for me and it's eye-opening I, I, I learned something new that I didn't know about. So, so Marcel, how do you do this? Like, you know, let's suppose you have a hundred things to do tomorrow. How do you make sure you focus on things one, two, and three versus going to number 87? Well, I have to, um, I, I bought this like uh, performance, um, uh, planner, you know, off of Amazon and, you know, keep my key focus on the top, you know, there's, everything is hot everything is important right you just have to pick your priorities you know what's the most important thing for me today and if i commit myself to do it you know today i'll stay up and get it done i mean same thing i do for my job too you know when i have things to do i'll do whatever it takes to work on weekend or night you know to get it done so michelle you know you're, you're a wife a mom entrepreneur corporate job I'm sure you're doing other things that we haven't talked about. How do you make sure you actually take care of yourself? I actually don't. <laughs> that's my same answer. That's the same same answer too when I get the question. I, I, I suck at this. Yeah, I'm really suck at this because I always tend to satisfy other people first before myself because I know that you know I'll 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 be okay. I just do self meditating and you know I'll I'll be fine. I but I have to be the best of who I am to other people. That's kind of my problem. I don't know if you believe in psychic, but every time when I go, they the number one thing they always tell me is it's okay to take time for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I say, do you know? <laughs> I do feel guilty when I the moment like the holiday, I I I spend a lot of time with my family and I I didn't spend much time, you know, working on my own projects and I feel really guilty. I mean, that guilt gets to you when, whenever I'm not working, I feel guilty. You know, if I go out for walk, oh, I could have spent that time yeah. working. You know? Or you watch a TV show and oh man, why did I watch the TV show for? Yeah, exactly. So, um, and this might be different for you since you have a corporate job. Like, you know, like most people like, like talking about Elon Musk, you know, he works hundred hours a week. Some people only work nine to five and they're an entrepreneur. You know, I have a friend who works 21 days, take three days off. How do you do your schedule? I don't have a schedule. I do whatever needs to be done, okay. whether it's weekend or night. Um, I don't really have a schedule. And I think that's something I, I totally prepare and expected to do when I go in to a business room. So I believe, uh, change the subject a bit. I think, how good the dates from? I think November 11th and December 4th, you had like a live virtual fashion event. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you talk about those? And it's, is that something you do every month or is this just a one time thing? This is something that I, I'm kind of doing um, every month or every other month, um, but I wanted to take a, a a pause and see if I allow more time in preparation would 
turns out a, a, a better outcome mm-hmm. uh, because I do have a lot of interest in find out. But you know, and who signed when, up for these things? Like other designers, potential customers? Oh, uh, there are um, potential customers. Okay. Yeah, and I even met a micro influencer okay. through that too, who love what we offer and. We're, we're gonna do you know co-creation for the next event too which is something that i'm gonna be doing i have to imagine a lot of work goes into putting these events like it doesn't matter it's not a matter of like putting a camera up and filming stuff it's like it's a lot of like people don't realize even like even live events or virtual events i don't think people have any idea the work in the back of the goes to putting these things together a lot and i really feel bad for the person who works for me in hong kong um she's not only a designer herself, but she also coordinated with other designers we showcasing and she's set up cameras and then the online streaming and you know and also um um getting the models ready, rehearsal, everything like I didn't think about uh, that. I didn't think about the models rehearsing. I had to fuck, yeah. Yeah. Lighting and you know and the voice and everything recording. Just so much going on. So are you going to try to do these once a month? That's, that's, that's too much. I think that might be a little bit too okay. much for my size right okay. now. I am trying to do it like every other month or, okay. you know, every quarter at least. I think having that, you know, uh, engagement and personal interaction with our customer is very important and getting people to know who those designers are. I'm not here to just sell the product. I'm here to help them build a brand and getting people to aware of who they are. And and you film this on different, different locations or just one location? One location. Okay. Yeah. And I'm being remote in Seattle and the main stage, you know, with model wearing different pieces is in Hong Kong. And how do you like find these models that, that like model for you? Um, through my designer. Okay. Yeah. They, they know a lot of people and, they're willing to, you know, help out. And there's another um, designer, you know, Vincent Lee on the platform also knows a lot of people and models and stuff that, you know, willing to come help out too. So. Um, so mo- modeling, how does that work? Like do models like become a model and they like pick who they want to like, model for, or is that like a whole different career field? It's not, they're, they're not like, uh, agency type of model, mm. but they they do um, wanted to pursuing modeling, or they already in um, performance, you know, dance performance mm-hmm. um, feel who are really good at you know knowing how to turn and move um, to show things. Um, some are just you know talented friend of his, you know, interested in helping out. So we talked about this a little bit, but. Can you talk more about your company, like where the idea came from, you know, why you started it, what you focus on right now, what your vision is for the company? Do you mean the business itself or the online event? It, it, the, the, the business itself. Oh, I started um, because of the compliments that I received from other people, you know, from wearing different pieces and people love what I was wearing and asked me where they're coming from and where I bought it from and they couldn't get them here. I'm uh, very disappointed. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's enough of that. It seems like there is a problem that, you know, I can help solve because how do people get to know about independent creative designers from different parts of the world? If they're not there or even they're there, they don't know where to find them, right? So how, how do you, uh, you know, help? bring that awareness to different parts of the world. And, and so what's your vision for the company? I know you want to fundraise. So you like, you want to like scale it up, like be one of the top agencies in the world or take and rule the world of fashion or. At least, um, you know, improving traction. I wouldn't say it has to be really big to start fundraising. Um, but I, I, I really want to demonstrate, you know, what I believe is true with data. Or do you have any like any uh, designers or fashion people or fashion industry people that you follow? Um, I do, and so this is not, you know, limited to who I follow, but also what is not being noticed too is, you know, because those are the designers need help the most. And 
you know, my my destination and vision is not here. I mean, this is just my um, starting point. You know, my vision is a lot bigger than that. So where do you draw inspiration from on a daily basis? Where do I get your inspiration from? Get my inspiration from? I mean, that is not my personal design. So I don't, I don't necessarily create the design um, for designers. Um, I'm building a business model that works in a way to solve people's problem. Can you talk some about how your platform works, like how you how you monetize the platform? Yeah, um, this is almost like a, a I'm playing as an advocate uh, advocate role for for designers and created this digital place where um, or hub where people can discover and access to them. Self, and it's going to be completely dropship model. So if you are a customer wanting to buy certain things on my website, it will be drop shipping from wherever the designer is to you directly. So let's suppose yeah. someone buys something on your platform, mm -hmm. they get it, it's a wrong size or whatever case it be. Mm -hmm. Do they come back to you or they go directly to the person who made it? They actually will submit that through me and then you know, um, if it's a wrong size or whatever, you know, it will be coordinated with the designer. Um, so, cause I have to, um, because I'm, it, it is a commission model. So I, I'm not making money from designers to join our platform unless they sold something through my platform, right? So um, I have to know when I need to pay them depending on when the customer uh, received the item and, you know, after their warm, you know, the return period than when I pay them. So I need to know where that is. So I think you talked about this before, but can you talk more about how you make sure like what they say they're selling is actually like high quality, high end, like all that kind of stuff. Like what's your process of that? Cause obviously you can't go to every design location and build it yourself, right? How do you make sure they're selling what they're saying they're selling? Um, I do ask for two um, sets of outfit as sample to me. Um, and, and I'll do look at their workmanship and the fabric and everything and make sure that it's not something, you know, very cheap, um, and not doable. Um, then I'll keep those pieces for, um, content creation or, you know, uh, influencer campaign that, you know, people get the free pieces and they can create, you know, um, their experience and post it. Do you have a favorite fabric or favorite cloth that you like your clothes to be made out of? Like you have a favorite? Personally, I love cashmere. Cashmere. Just because I I like the 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 comfy feeling. Um, but it doesn't matter what it's made out of. I I I think comfortable, you know, and softness is very important. I didn't care about that when I was younger. It's all about style. Right. And then you'll learn over time that, oh, after one wash or whatever, you know, a few washes, it's 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 not the same anymore. And then you have to, you know, throw it away. So um, that is not very sustainable. And I want something more timeless and something doable. I can keep it for years to come and it's still fresh. So you have your e-commerce platform. Is there anything different about your e-commerce platforms for like the tech piece or data or apps or anything versus another e-commerce platform? This is something that I'm going to um, grow into is, you know, leveraging data to um, find better pieces for better satisfaction, customer satisfaction experience. But because I'm bootstrapping right now uh, and resources are very limited. Yeah, all the AI yeah. stuff sounds sexy, but it's expensive as hell. Yeah, it is. Um, so... I mean, ultimately, you know, I'm going to have to leverage technology to get to my vision. Do you see some of the word like AI, like picks clothes out for someone down the road? Oh, yeah. or I mean, right now, I mean, the, there's a very basic level that, you know, it's being done on, you know, whatever e-commerce platform you use. There's some very basic ones, but, you know, it's nothing near, you know, where we need it to be. Um, but, you know, there's you know, AI and there's AR that you go into. And it's always my vision wanted to, you know, get people to see what they 
look like before they buy it. Um, that's part of the, the roadmap. Yeah, I think people have, like, some people know how big AI is going to be. I don't think most people know how AI is going to take over the world, right? I know there's a startup out of Boston called Everjet, and they're using AI to, like, do dental exams, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you're like, what? Yeah, there is a lot of um, companies out there is develop, you know, developing different technologies um, that is really creative and, you know, mind-blowing. So uh, I, I don't think that I'm going to be there um for a, a period of time but you know it's gonna be there someday so yeah um so michelle is there anything i sort of i should ask you that it didn't or anything else you want to talk about um no i think you get it covered really well and if you have any additional questions you know let me know yes um so i forgot to ask you this during our pre-talk but you have like any gift or resources to give away some people do some people don't um, you know, I do sometimes like, for example, like Cyber Monday, I do a little giveaway for, you know, tagging your friends and whatnot. And I'm also, you know, looking for, you know, the right type of influencer, you know, to do um, some collaboration where I'm giving out, you know, free items for them, uh, as opposed to, you know, paying them, you know, so it's got to be some you know, micro influencer or people who wants to support small businesses and uh, independent designers. So Michelle, can you share your social media links with everyone for you and your company? Yeah, my handle is Avant Gardas Inc. Um, it's the same across all the social media platform, um, all the major ones that you can think of, like Pinterest, um, IG, Facebook, Twitter, um, TikTok, all those the same. So I really like your Instagram. Are, are you are you the one taking the picture of Instagram or you have someone doing your Instagram for you? Uh, I'm having people to do my Instagram for me. Um, it's mostly our, you know, designer generated content or content that, you know, we find, uh, we, we look for designers um, who are creative and we wanted to um, tell our audience about who they are um, on our Instagram or, you know, pictures of our, our product in our shop as well. And we're going to have more content going to be created for um, the upcoming um, collection from a couple of designers. We're going to have some videos and uh, we're going to have some behind the scenes, you know, what it takes to prepare for it. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. I, I don't know if the right to Instagram definitely pops off the page, so to speak, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, really good. Yeah. And we'll you know, you can see, you know, wheel as well, you know, from the videos. I think people are really, I think, getting very short on patience. So you have to keep it really short yeah. in a way that I you want it now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be entertained now. Yeah, exactly. Keep it short and sweet and get my attention or else, you know, I'm just going to go to the next. <laughs> are there any upcoming designers that the, most people don't know about? Oh, there's plenty, you know, you're going to have to follow me to see them. <laughs> Do you have a favorite designer? Oh, too many to name. So um, you will see my pick as because, you know, all the designers that I like, you know, is going to be on my platform mm -hmm. for sure, um, because I personally create them. So designers, like if you have a regular job, like your corporate job you have, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have a 401k, you know, benefits, whatever. Yeah. I'm guessing designers don't have that, do they? No, unfortunately, no, they do not. And they're bootstrapping like I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they don't have, mostly don't have necessarily a full-time job um, to keep their business moving. And so many of them are struggling. Yes, yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of anything else I need to talk, talk to you about. I think we've recovered a good deal today. Yeah. So do, um, and for, for our listeners would have her, her gift and her social media links on the show notes. Mm -hmm. You find the show notes at www.cabinetshoblog.com. So Michelle, um, can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Um, I just think that um, for people who don't, don't know who I am, please check out, you know, our shop at, yeah, shop.avantgardist.com. And I'm also launching my website, um, uh, avantgardist.com shortly. It's 
you know, just in the final stage of, you know, getting that finalized. And you'll see, you know, some of the creative that designers have created and who we are, our stories and whatnot, you know, in our um, web page. And you can connect with us at info at avantgardist.com. So Michelle, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate the opportunity. It's my pleasure talking with you today. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.